20. Steelers offense analysis. Um, how is this offense going to change under the new offensive coordinator, coordinator Matt Canada? How is Najee Harris going to impact this offense? The Muth as well. A little cheeky second round pick in the Muth. So let's get into it. First things first. Steelers offense, major problem last year was that they were not able to run the football, right? It was weird for an 11-0 football team, them not being able to run the football for about three-fourths of the season. After the first couple mm -hmm. handful of games, and even the first handful of games, it was not efficient, right? They were getting mitigated a ton. They, they still were able to get over 100 yards and be an average running football team. Yeah, Second half of the I, season... I remember I remember Biddy Snow had a hundred yard rusher in that first game against the Giants. And then I I really don't remember another hundred yard rusher from that point on from that season. Yeah, they had they had a hundred yards the first couple of games, and then after that it was just disaster, right? I mean they, they had a hundred yards against the Texans, but everyone had a hundred yards against the Texans. Um yeah. but looking at Matt, so you know, you fire Randy Finkner. Clearly, the M.O. with Matt Canada is get this rushing offense at least to average. Get Ben some help. Get the play-action game back because Ben can't do mm -hmm. it all by himself. He's just not able to anymore. Maybe years ago he was able to, but you're not going to be able to win a Super Bowl on the back of a 39, 40-year-old Ben Roethlisberger. It's clear as day. He's just not able to hang in the pocket that long. So this chart is showing... Matt Canada's past offenses, all in college football. And it's clear, aside from 2013, running the football has been a huge priority for him. If we go to the percentage breakdowns, right, you've seen there are a couple offenses where 60% of their total yards, over 60%, is rushing yards, right? In 2012 with Wisconsin and 2018 with Maryland. 2016 and 2017, with Pittsburgh and LSU respectively, they had more rushing yards and passing yards. Yes, that was partly due to the personnel. Yes, that was partly due to the fact that in college football, you're just able to run the football easier than in the NFL. But they, they this, this team needs to get back to running the football, and I'm hoping Matt Canada can do so. So how does he do it schematically? First things first. If you watch Matt Canada, if you've watched any of his previous games as an offensive coordinator, it is pre-snap movement city and post-snap movement. There is an, like an ass ton, and I mean like a metric ass ton of pre-snap movement in his offense. It's actually ridiculous. So here's the, a great example. 2016 against Clemson. This is a, Clemson's defense at its height, right? This is an insane mm -hmm. Clemson defense. Um, with all those dudes, Wilkins and Dexter Lawrence and Cleland Farrell up front, right? So yeah, they're gonna they they just got like a 40-yard pass play, and they're gonna hurry up to the line of scrimmage, try to get them in a base defense. So then all of a sudden, okay, we're gonna we're gonna change our, our front. We got a, a tackle over here lined up out wide. We got a tight end now at left tackle. Like, okay, really wacky look. So that you're gonna get their line to shift. Okay, let's let's go back. We don't like that. <laughs> let's go back. And we're going to have two tight ends now on the right side. So it's going to be a power to the right. So what they're going to do is you're going to get this Clemson D-line to shift back to the left, right? It makes sense. They're, they're power to left. You're going to get this motion to the right. Get you know Try and fool these linebackers. But then you're going to get a run to the left. And what that did was – let me rewind this really quickly. What all this movement ended up doing is get this D-line – to shift to the left so that we can create a numbers – or shift to the right so we can create a numbers advantage to the left. So what you're going to have, you're going to have a tackle one-on-one -on -one just kicking out this D-end. Then I believe it's a center and a guard. It might be a guard and a tackle. There's so much movement going on. Be able to go one-on-one -on -one against this linebacker and this safety so that there's – every everyone's got a hat on a hat. There's no one mm -hmm. left to tackle James Conner on that side of the field. It's really creative stuff, and it's created with all of that pre-snap commotion going on, getting Clemson to shift their line the wrong direction so that they can create a numbers advantage. And you see this a lot in these Matt Canada offenses, and it's really fun to watch. So here's going to be an example of, of a similar thing where we're going to get a shift, and in this shift, 
instead of creating a numerical advantage, we're going to create a personnel advantage where we're going to take our tight end, and I think this is some sort of running back type, put them on the left, but we're going to have an unbalanced front with two tackles and a guard on the right side. And then, you know, we're going to motion our running back type back. This line doesn't adjust. And then all of a sudden, we're going to run jet sweep with a huge personnel advantage to the right side for a huge play. So speaking of the jet sweep, basically every single play in the Matt Canada offense has some sort of jet sweep tied to it. You will mm-hmm. not see a snap. You will rarely see a snap where some dude is not motioning for a jet sweep, the possibility of some sort of jet sweep. Maybe uh, aside from like third and longs where it's not really a threat, every single time there is a situation where a jet sweep could be a threat, there's it, you're, you're, you're going to get that look. So when you look at all their regular old runs, they have jet sweep looks, right? Their jet sweeps tied to it. So you're going to get – this is just a basic little – gap run to the right and you have that jet sweep tied to it and what this does i also think you have the blocking for it as well which is fun you have the weak side yeah you have the weak side of your line where the jet sweep would go they always have the blocking ready for it so they it's not just this guy motioning out a lot of the time you have that whether it's a tight end or a tackle also blocking for it which you have to always have guys on your defense account for it So then what they'll do, this is literally the very next play. This is the very next play. Oh, no, it's not the very next play. I think this is two plays later. Basically the same look, but instead of two receivers on the same side, it's just balanced two by two, right? Well, now you're going to get the jet sweep. And they don't account for it, and Russell Gage is able to get a walk-in touchdown, untouched. And it is just a nuisance for defenses to have to deal with these jet sweeps. So, okay, what happens if you just tell your defensive ends, hey, play the jet sweep, hard commit to this jet sweep. So you're going to see here, Florida decides, hey, we're going to hard commit to this jet sweep. We're going to make sure that it gets shut down. Well, the very this is now the very next play. What Matt Canada does, he's one step ahead of these. It's a very if-then structure. We're going to run a counter right at this defensive end. We're going to let him, we're going to want him to fly upfield so that we can get one of our guys from the left side to trap this dude and get a wide-open counter. Running him right at that defensive end. It's brilliant because on these counter plays, you want that defensive end to fly upfield and play that jet sweep because it – it plays right into the blocking structure of this counter run. And if if Darius Geis doesn't trip up on this play, if he doesn't trip up on his own offensive lineman a little bit, dude, that's one-on-one with a safety. He could easily be yeah, gone. He's easily breaking that for a touchdown. So what else does Matt Kennedy do? One of my favorite things that Matt Kennedy does, and this is one of the reasons why I now in like my dynasty leagues – and much higher on Najee Harris than I was before, is that he does a really good job of setting up his running backs one-on-one against defensive backs. And if you looked at my running back analysis video a while back, you don't have to look at it, but long story short, one of my favorite things that I saw about Najee Harris is that one-on-one against defensive backs, he is extremely dangerous. That is where he breaks most of his tackles. So this is 2012 Wisconsin against Nebraska. This is the Big 12 championship, I believe. What they're going to do is they're going to have what looks exactly like a zone split, right? Where you're going to have this tight end. Let me see if I can pull up the pen here. Yeah. This tight end on classic zone split zone run is going to kick out this D end, right? You're going to kick this guy out. All these linemen are stepping to the right, blocking down a traditional zone run, and this running back is running to the right, and if he sees a cutback lane, he's going to hit it. Right? Simple stuff. Uh, Shift clear. Yeah, there we go. But instead, this is really brilliant, because this defensive end and this outside linebacker 
basically have all this contained unless you want Monty Ball right here, one of the nation's top rushers at the time, one-on-one mm-hmm. against this corner. There's a lot of pressure on these guys on an outside run to contain. So what Matt Canada ends up calling is that they have like this counter tied to this split zone concept where instead of running your classic split zone, this tight end is going to come out here, but he's going to seal this edge inside. And then you're going to motion this line, this, this receiver inside to crack this linebacker, which is going to create Monty ball one-on-one with this corner, which is a huge matchup advantage for, for Wisconsin here. So let's get it run here. And this is exactly what I want to see with Najee Harris and the Pittsburgh Steelers. Because if this is Najee Harris, dude, you could go look at all his highlights, like especially against Notre Dame, where he's hurdling D-backs, he's trucking them, juking them out. They have no answers for him. And this is exactly the type of concepts that Najee Harris would excel in. And this is the type of concepts that would give the Steelers some sort of identity outside of quick passing. So, yeah, this is perfect for Najee Harris. I actually said, I quoted in my analysis, he's at his best in one-on-one scenarios against defensive backs. Will win around eight out of ten times in those scenarios in space. It's exactly what the Steelers need. And that's what they were missing with their current or last year's backfield with James Conner and and Anthony McFarland and uh, Benny Snell and Snell. all those guys, they just weren't really that dangerous in space. They were all right when you were just, hey, listen, let's just plug it up the middle. They get you two or three yards, but we really couldn't get any dynamic runs outside of James Conner, and he was inconsistent the entire season. So how else does this scheme really help Najee Harris? Well, the one thing that I was really scared of with Najee Harris, a system him going into – was a team that's just going to run 80 to 90% of their runs just zone blocking concepts, right? Like you've seen with the Rams a couple of years ago with Gurley. It was 60, 50% of their runs outside zone, then the other 30% inside zone, and then the other 10% is obviously the other run concepts. But they were basically, basically scheme dependent, depending on if we get a specific look. Yeah, we'll run this blocking concept because we're creating a numbers advantage. I was scared of Najee Harris going into that type of system because I thought at Alabama he did a really good job reading second-level defenders, right, mainly the linebackers, and he did a really good job on on duo runs, power, counter, which are all these gap running schemes. And Matt Canada has has shown in, in his previous offenses really nice balance between running zone and gap concepts. So here's an example of just your classic pin and pull. Let's get the pen back. Oh, pen, pen, where you at? There you go. We're just going to get a pin on this defensive end, and then we're pulling these guys around. Come on, clear. And this is just a nice little power concept, pretty basic stuff. And I think that Najee Harris and the Steelers personnel really fit this type of run. I mean, we've been trying to do it, and it just hasn't worked with the personnel we had last year. Now that you have Najee Harris, you draft a couple of offensive linemen. You replace Marquise Pouncey, who was kind of washed towards the end of the season. I think that we can finally get back to this power football. And it will really help out Najee Harris and the Steelers. So here's duo, right? Najee Harris is great on duo. I'll actually show it with the Steelers first. So this is one of Najee Harris's favorite run concepts is duo. So duo, you're going to get two double teams on the interior defensive linemen, and they're going to work to the linebackers. And the running back's job is to read the flow of these linebackers, right? We're, we're running it. You can see this hole, right? Right in the A gap. If they spill, then we're cutting it back. If they plug, then we're bouncing, and then if not, we're just shoving it right up the A-gap. We're just going down Main Street. And the whole theory, right, you get your your shoulders square to the hole and run it up here because we're getting these double teams working to the linebackers. And you can see Benny Snell does not run the play. He wants to bounce it. And, yeah, there's a hole here, but the play is designed to go right up Main Street. Just take the yards, man. Take the yards. And, I mean, as many Steelers runs, it didn't work. (laughs) You know, common theme from last year. 
Here's another example. Here's James Conner this time. We're running duo. Here, there's a huge lane for a cutback. You could do a bounce here because both these linebackers are plugging the A-gap. But as many Steelers runs were last year, didn't read the second level defenders correctly. Mm -hmm. What is Najee Harris's best run concept and what is his biggest strength? His best run, run concept, at least from my analysis, was duo and his biggest strength reading these second level defenders. I went over this in my last analysis. Here's duo. You can see it. Let me rewind it real quick because that was really fast. Look at these linebackers. They're going to spill over the top. I think that's Patrick Queen. Spills over the top, creates a huge cutback lane. Here's an even clearer example against Auburn in 2020, last season. You're reading these linebackers. Where are they moving? Where are they flowing? They spill over the top. You see this linebacker? He spills over the top, creates a massive cutback lane. Split second decision, he's able to see and read these read these linebackers. He's really good at it. And this is exactly what the Steelers have needed for so long. So I think here's some more examples of the Steelers running backs last year kind of sucking at reading second level defenders on duo. So this is duo here. You're not going to get this second double team here because the linebacker shoots the gap, right? So David DeCastro is responsible for this linebacker. If he shoots the gap, you kind of have to adjust on the fly. I forget the exact blocking terms. Look, you see this linebacker? It's clear as day. You can see him. Just, just watch him. Come on. Look at this linebacker. Spills way over the top. Look what it creates. Massive cutback lane. Obviously, as many Steelers runs, James Conner didn't hit it. It's not a terrible run. You got like two yards, but you had an opportunity for a huge play. Mm -hmm. Here's another example. This isn't duo. This is just, I think, it, dude, this is honestly, this blocking is so trash. It's hard to tell what run concept this is. It looks just like inside zone to the left. But Anthony McFarland just cut off the back of David DeCastro here. Like you find the initial hole, great. But reading these second level defenders and these second level blocks, dude, you have a massive play one on one against the safety, possibly for a touchdown if you cut this off the back of your all pro guard. But of course, he doesn't. And it's like a four-yard run. Like, it's not a terrible run, but you can see the reason why the Steelers were just like, no, we're not going to run the football. Because it's not there. What's the point? Yeah, might as well not do it. So, okay. Aside from being able to run duo much better than the current slew of Steelers running backs, I think the other thing that will really help Najee Harris out in the system is his receiving ability. So this is something that I really like for Matt Canna. And they're running this with Monte Ball. Imagine this is a, a running back with the receiving ability in Najee Harris. So you're going to start off. You're going to have quads to the right. Then you're going to motion all these tight ends or whoever these guys are, whether they're running backs, fullbacks, or tight ends. They look like a bunch of tight ends. Now you're going to motion it to trips left. Now you're going to motion Monte Ball out to make it quads left. So what you essentially did – was that you take your initial look. Let me see if I can get back. Your initial look, right? You have quads to the right with your receiver, your number one receiver out to the left. And now you create the same look, but with Monte Ball, I'm pretty sure he's going to be matched up one-on-one -on -one against the linebacker here. Yeah, he's going to be matched up one-on-one -on -one against the linebacker quads left. This is perfect for Najee Harris. I mean, you saw mm -hmm. him. I can. I wish I had the LSU clip where he does that, he catches that back shoulder touchdown against Patrick Queen against LSU. Like, yeah, dude, exactly what he's playing. Yeah. Najee Harris is going to burn most linebackers one-on-one. -on -one. That's why he got drafted number 24 overall, at least one of the prime reasons. He's insanely athletic and has really good body control. Matt Canada, if he's able to create these matchups with these pre-snap motions and pre-snap looks that confuses defenses – this could be huge for Najee Harris, not only for the Steelers, but for his fantasy production. This could create some serious mm -hmm. receiving production. So, yeah, I think they actually do try to throw it to him. They just try to hit him vertically. Okay, they don't. 
get one on one up top. But you can see the potential in, in their looks. And then clearly, you know, other classic receiving examples. Here's an example from last year where you're going to get a sprint right half back in the flat. Najee Harris will easily be able to make a living off of these types of concepts. Okay, let me get out of here. Um, all in all, I think that Najee Harris in the Steelers is a really, really good fit for this offense. It's a really, really good fit for Matt Canada. Matt Canada has a great track record with talented running backs and maximizing their production. But there's a problem, but there's a catch. The first thing is that with all this pre-snap motion, with all this guys moving left, right, center, for defenses to respect all this motion, you have to give these guys the football. And that means that they're going to take carries and, and, and targets away from Najee Harris. These jet sweeps that are tied to basically every single run in Matt Canada's playbook are going to get called and going to get called a lot more than they were last year, which means that it's not just going to be Najee Harris outside zone 25, 30 times a game, like some of these other, like Derrick Henry's getting, right? Mm -hmm. it, I, I just don't think it's going to be that. Let me actually pull up this, this chart. I can prove it to you. Let me zoom out. Bang. Okay, so I looked at, in Matt Canada's previous offenses, the percentage of running back one carries that the number the, the highest producing running back got in Matt Canada offenses. The highest total percentage, which was Monte Ball in Wisconsin, he only got 57% of the total carries of that offense, which was easily the highest. Even running backs, freaking um, Darius Geis at LSU, 43%. James Conner at Pittsburgh, 41%. If you want to compare him to someone like Le'Veon Bell in Pittsburgh, which people are expecting him to, to get that type of workload, Le'Veon Bell got 73.5% of the carries, 69% yeah. of the carries. Nice. 64% of the carries. All of these seasons, which were his best seasons, which were much higher than Matt Canada has ever given his number one running back. Yeah, that's interesting to think because I'm looking back at those college teams they had. Do you think it has to do with, like, Monte Bowl, we, we talked about earlier, he played in that very competitive running back room, right? With yeah, James well, Wyatt and... so that's the caveat, right, is that, okay, well, let's look at the running back. He had the the talent in his, um, in his running back rooms to split up these carries, right? Okay, you have Monte Ball, James White, and Melvin Gordon. Obviously, you're going to get all three of these guys involved. You know, James Conner, Quadri Henderson was a talented receiver who you were going to give carries to. But at the same time, I, I don't really expect, especially with all this motion stuff, all these jet sweeps, Claypool to not get more than like 10 carries. For um, Deontay Johnson to not get more than two or three or four carries on the season, right? I expect mm -hmm. all of their workloads to improve to complement all of this movement, right? It's just, even if Najee Harris gets 60% of the workload, I've calculated that already. He'll get about 245 carries. If he gets 4.3 yards per carry, he'll get 1,050 yards. Okay, if you account for the 17th game, that's 257 carries and 1,100 yards. That's at 60% of the total carries of this offense at 4.3 yards per carry, which is and that's using the average of these Le'Veon Bell seasons, right? Mm -hmm. For that, for the amount of carries the Steelers used in those years. I feel like that's a pretty favorable – this is just the rushing production, by the way. That's a pretty favorable outlook to look at it that way. I mean, way. that would be a great rookie season. Yeah, that would be – but yeah. is he going to get 260 carries and average 4.3 yards per carry behind a Steelers offensive line that's – probably ranked bottom 10 in run blocking right now. If you look at like PFF charts and all that, it's just a lot to ask for, right? It's just, it, is he even going to break that 60% of the total carries looking at the film and looking at the offense and what Matt Canada has done historically. And it's not like he, he doesn't have other talented running backs. I mean, 
three of the of the guys in that running back room, he's already coached. He's coached mm-hmm. um Anthony McFarland. He's coached Jalen Samuels, and he's coached Derek Watt. And you might be saying, oh, Derek Watt, scoffing him because he's a fullback. Dude, you look at that Wisconsin tape. He used Derek Watt. It's not like yeah. Derek Watt wouldn't get some carries. And even if it's only 10 to 15 touches on the season, that's still taken away 10 to 15 touches from Najee Harris, which could make or break him being – the RB one that he is drafted to be right now. So, okay. What else? Um, let me get to this sheet of paper. Yeah. So like the bell cow percentages that people are, are drafting him to have historically just haven't happened in these Matt Canada offenses. It didn't happen last year. It didn't happen in 2012. It didn't happen in any of these years. We just showed it. So, you are kind of drafting a running back in a Matt Canada offense to be something that is unprecedented in his offense, which isn't terribly impossible. It's just you're just you're drafting something that's not happened before, right? Mm-hmm. In his rookie season, might I add, with a coach that has a bunch of running backs he's already coached before that might know the system better day one. Um, the last thing is that. Najee Harris is going to be used as a decoy more in this system than in other systems. It's just going to happen. With all this misdirection and and all this motioning around, Najee Harris is going to be the focal point for defenses to stop, which means that Matt Canada is going to use him as the eye candy in a lot of this. A lot of this. It's going to be the jet sweeps are the eye candy, and Najee Harris is the eye candy, and they're going to use play action. They're going to use shovel passes to guys like the Muth and Eric Ebron and Claypool when they're lined up inside and probably Juju, all these dudes. So once again, that just takes away from some of the production that Najee Harris could have. And when you're going to compare him numbers wise to Najee, not Najee Harris, to Derrick Henry. Yeah, Derrick Henry's used as a decoy, but. It's either play action or we're shoving it up the gut with Derrick Henry. There's really no in between. This <laughs> offense is going to be a lot more creative than that Tennessee offense was last season. It's just mm-hmm. that's how Matt Canada rolls. That You look at the film, that's just what he does. So all of that combined just, to me, limits his chances of being that top running back that he's drafted right now. So my prediction – I think that his ceiling prediction, his ceiling projection for me, is kind of similar to David Montgomery's numbers last season, where he's going to get 240 carries, get just north of 1,000 yards on the year. Um, But the real X factor is the receiving work. Because everyone Mm -hmm. knows us, we just showed it. He was drafted for it. He's a phenomenal receiver. And that is what you need for Najee Harris to be a true RB1 in fantasy football and what is going to separate him from being just an above average back to being an elite running back. I agree. You got any thoughts, Steve, on all this? I mean, I I like what you said, like using him as a decoy or in this role, he's going to be used as more as a decoy. I feel like, honestly, that opens up the playbook a lot for the Steelers because, you know, in the past, especially last year, you know, with the running game being non-existent, especially after the first quarter of the season, you know, it was kind of – it was easy for defenses kind of sniff out what they were trying to do. Even if Najee Harris is not on that 1,100-yard uh, projection, you know, his receiving skills – or just him being the decoy could still help the offense tremendously. Yeah, I think the last thing that I wanted to mention in terms of his receiving output is that I really don't think he's going to be one of those Alvin Kamara-like receivers where he's getting 8 to 10 targets a game, you know, good 5 to 6 catches, and basically put up half running back, half receiver numbers. But... I do think that Najee Harris will be put in positions to make big chunk plays in the receiving Mm -hmm. game, whether it be for touchdowns or whether it be vertically down the field, because that's the thing that I think separates Najee Harris as a receiver from even someone like Travis Etienne is that vertically down the field against anyone, 
even good coverage players like nickel defenders, safeties, and corners, he is a threat, right? If you want to throw a 50-50 ball to Najee Harris against a smaller defender, he can go up and win that 50-50 ball, which you just don't get in a lot of other of these classic receiving backs, right? Like you're not going to go and throw up a 50-50 ball against a corner to Travis Etienne. That's just a death sentence in the NFL. Even in college, it's probably a death sentence. But Najee Harris is able to do that. That's the skill set that he brings. So in terms of being an X factor as a receiver, red zone plays. Is he going to one-on-one against the linebacker? You might throw him a fade. You might say, dude, we're going to throw you a fade. We might throw you a slant. So that's what will separate Najee Harris to be an RB1. So if you're projecting him to be a Derrick Henry type workload guy, I would be skeptical. And I wouldn't be drafting him for that. I would be drafting him to say, hey, this dude, once red zone comes, he's going to be a touchdown machine. He's going to be a big play machine in the receiving game. And he's mm-hmm. going to bring an element to the Steelers offense that they just haven't had in years. Yeah, I agree with that. I think the offense would be – it's going to take a huge step forward with now Najee Harris at the helm. 